Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. It's great to uh, welcome you this afternoon um, at uh, the revised time. So thank you for making a note of that and coming uh, so promptly to hear our March talk. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining online as well as all of you who've been able to come in person. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Abby Day, who is a sociologist of religion and she holds a doctorate in religious studies from the University of Lancaster and for some years was a senior research fellow in religious studies here at the University of Kent. So you're, you're no stranger to Canterbury. It's great to welcome you back. Currently, Abby is professor of faith, faith oh, race, faith and culture in the sociology department at Goldsmiths at the University of London, where her teaching, research, and publishing focuses on the sociology of religion, gender, generations, crime, and justice. She's executive editor of the Brill series for the Association for the Sociology of Religion and has chaired the Sociology of Religion study group within the British Sociological Association. Abby also serves as an advisor to the government's Office for National Statistics on census questions regarding religion. Her most recent book and the focus of today's talk is Why Baby Boomers Left Religion, Shaping Belief and Belonging from 1945 to 2021. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you very much for coming here. It's always a bit disarming for an academic like myself to come to a group who really know what you're talking about. <laughs> Because people who actually are engaged in, in the idea of theology or engaged in the idea of religion because it's interesting, rather than they're just paid to do it, I find a fascinating audience. So I do look forward to discussion, questions, any points you might be able to share with me when I finish this part of the presentation. Um, so yes, as was mentioned, I'm doing the main part of my presentation about this book. And here's the advice, don't buy this book, please. Don't buy this book. Uh, like most academic books, it's ridiculously expensive. It's, it's destined to go into university libraries. But there are discounts available. So if you really do want the book, get in touch with me, and um, I can help you with that. Um, but it's an important book, because what I was trying to do here was look at why and how we can explain what I've seen as a massive Christian decline over the last few decades. And my conclusion is that, and not personally just mine, but my, my argument and, and certainly the core of the presentation tonight, is that this is for reasons to do with generation. So it is a generational trend of decline. And those are the themes I want to be talking about today. And, and marking the difference between when we're saying generation, um, people can argue about what you mean by the generation and, and what year do we talk about, and I don't know, 20, 25 years. But the most important thing about a generation is that it has a sense of itself. It sees itself as a generation. And some people don't. I am belonging to no generation. I'm kind of a, slightly too young to be a proper boomer, uh, too old to be a you know, Gen X, and somewhere in the middle. But the baby boomers did define themselves and could see themselves as a generation. But what happened? What happened when they were going through life, and I, my argument here is that they went through life thinking, I guess, as everybody did then, it was normal to go to church, but then something happened, and they stopped going to church. And importantly, when they had children, they didn't bring their children to church. And those millennials now don't bring their children to church. So what we see here are decades of decline. And I therefore think, and I have no other possibilities in my toolbox. Um, and of course, uh, excuse me, for all the social theory I know, that this is a trend that's irreversible. So that's the kind of argument that I'm going to be going through today. So what we're talking about here is something that's happened that's different. Now, I started this 
discussion with the people about their ideas of generation and Christianity. When I went to research people you might know, um, I centered on the Anglican Church, but I was talking to the elderly women who had belonged to that church for most of their lives, who were not wanting to be priests. In fact, they didn't really like the idea. But what they wanted to do was perform what they thought were their acts of Christian duty. And they enjoyed that. They cleaned the church. They made teas. They polished the brass. And they loved it. And in my field, strangely enough, nobody had ever studied them. They weren't, I don't know, interesting. They were just kind of forgotten. So I made that my task to go and figure out who they were. So I spent two years as an ethnography working with them in churches. One thing I noticed day after day was that their children weren't there. Their older baby boomer children weren't there. And so I asked them sometimes about that. And I said, so why isn't, you know, the rest of your family here, your children? And they said things like, well, you know, nowadays, they're so busy. You know, they've got kids with their football practice. Or they, you know, work during the week, so they have to do the shopping. And they, you know, kind of went on for a while, those kind of discussions. Until one day when I said this to a woman, she said, well, I don't know, why don't you ask them? And as anybody who's met an Anglican woman of that age, you do as you're told. You do, absolutely, as you're told. So I said, okay, that will be my next project. I'll go and ask them. So I'll go and ask that generation, why aren't they following in the footsteps of their mothers? So we have here a generation that saw itself very much doing what they believed to be their Christian duty, and they loved it. They loved the idea that they had just lay women, that they were lay women. They didn't want priests. They were happy with the hierarchy. They were happy with the fact the queen was the, the church's head. All of that, they loved. What I began to think there was that was a very different set of values, perhaps, than I'd recognize amongst their baby boomer children. So I wanted to find out what happened. Why did they move from being so religiously devout to not being? And why did they continue now this trend? Until now we have, you know, the latest, I suppose, we call the Gen X and then Millennials and then Gen Z or Gen Z. The trend now has become, I think, irreversible. I know that's depressing. And I sometimes give talks to churches and at the end they say, well, what can we do about it? And I say, I don't know, pray. I have no, nothing in my toolkit that tells you what to do about it. Because this is, seems to me, a generational decline. And if it's a generational decline, how do we go about it? So I always quote the Church of England here. It's always great to use their own statistics, and they know this. They know that it's a, as well be said, a demographic time bomb. They've known that for ages. They don't know what to do about it, but they know it exists. So we have another set of information we can look at. We can look at the census that comes out, you know, every 10 years. And the first time they asked a question in 2001, what is your religion? So they've been charting this over the last 20 years. And what I found was this difference has become remarkable. So over the years, the number of people who have said they are Christian has been declining. And the number of people who say they have no religion has been increasing. Now, of course, there's a bit of media reaction to that, depending on what newspapers you read. You might find that the first quote there from The Guardian, which they actually corrected because it's very bad to mix up your, your numbers there by, you know, numbers, uh, percentage of people and, and absolute numbers. Daily Mail being typically very worried about things, saying, you know, I've just put that up verbatim. It is their bold. It is their, their caps. Okay? Oh, no! Less than half the population, they're saying. The last census came true. Less than half the population is Christian. And so there has been quite a lot of media reaction. But let's be careful and look at the reality here. They're not less Christians because they're, no more, because they're more Muslims, okay? That's not what's happened here. Muslims have grown insignificantly, really, in terms of total numbers. Other religions may have as well for a little bit. But that's not the story. That's not what has happened. What's happened is this. The biggest change are the people who say they have no religion. Now, that has grown absolutely astronomically since 2001. And who are these people? Well, these are the people who are the children of the baby boomers, typically. The so-called millennials and now getting into Generation Z. This is the fastest growing category of religion, related categories, 
in the UK, in North America, in Northern Europe, the category of no religion. Or, you know, sometimes they call that in the, in the States, they call them the nuns. Gets a bit of a laugh for five minutes, or I think a bit thin. Um, so this is the biggest group, right? People who have no religion. And I want to be clear here. I'm not talking about people who, my dear friend and colleague, Grace Davy, invented or used this term, the unchurched. As if there's a lot of people out there who really secretly believe in God and really are Christian but just don't go to church. No, we're not talking about that. No, we're talking about people who would not go to church because they have no religion. And they haven't always been the same people who you might say became spiritual. No, not, not really. If you talk to the Gen Zs today, those people in their 20s, and some of my colleagues have done quite interesting research, it's not that they're against religion. It's just, as one person said, not even on their radar. Okay, so this has become insignificant to so many people. Why? I go back here. Because there is this generational decline. So we can say that. We can say that the baby boomers lost their religion. We can say that the baby boomers then have you know, raised people who are less religious, and those in turn have raised people who are even less religious. Yes, yes, we know that. But why? And the reason I'm on the government's academic advisory board for statistics is not because of my maths. I don't really do maths very well. It's because I want to find out the questions behind the question and also make sure when people are presenting ideas about the census that they've thought through these things. So the numbers are, are there, but what is behind the numbers? Just as a, as a little aside here, because we're in a Methodist church, you know, different forms of Christianity have been hit harder and then others. And certainly the Methodists have been hit very hard. The Anglicans have been hit the hardest in terms of who belongs now to Anglican churches, which is also a little interesting, isn't it? Because it is quasi-national church. And they have lost numbers more than others. And there's wings of the Anglican church, certainly the evangelical wing that looks quite good. You know, the, what is it, 56, I think, is a number of the average size of an Anglican congregation on a Sunday, 56. Holy Trinity Brompton, you're going to get 2,500. Uh, little churches where I live, you might get 10. We're talking averages, right? There's variations, but overall, there's only one way the graph is going. And overall, it's declined. So let me just tell you about what I tried to do then, having been told by that older woman to go and do it. Um, I wanted to find out why this was so. What happened to, to cause these baby boomers not to follow in their mother's footsteps. And so I constructed a sample, you know, a group of people I knew I had to interview, and I wanted them to be very specific. So I chose one institution, which is in social science, always easiest to do, keep your institutions, too many institutions, and you're do, doing too many comparisons. So I, I chose Anglicanism. It would fit what I was doing already. I'd already done the elderly women. And I was looking now to look at the continuity. I, but I wanted people who had been actually born into a church-attending family. I wanted the children of those, you know, devout women. I wanted to know what happened. I wanted them to have been at church, who have gone to Sunday school. I wanted them to have been baptized and confirmed. In other words, to have gone through everything we would expect and then to have no religion. Surprising easy to find those people. They're all around. So that became my sample, if you like. And here's just a very brief overview of my findings, and I'm going to go into more detail soon. One of my findings was that they have a godless morality. Now, there seems to be sometimes a, a worry, and certainly when the census questions come out every 10 years and we get these results, I'm often interviewed by people who want to know more behind the scenes. I hope you've seen me. I mean, every 10 years the census comes around, and for one week, I'm really famous. <laughs> so watch out for this another 10 years. And so when we talk about these in the interviews, one of the questions that often comes up is something like, but, well, without religion, you know, what's going to happen, you know, in terms of morality? Well, what we find here is that religion and morality are not the same thing at all. Is that, guess what? People find morality from all sorts of ways. And when I interview people and ask them about where they get their morality from, you know, I generally hear the same thing, right? They get them from home, sometimes school. Sometimes people say the Ten Commandments. But on closer inspection, they're not talking about the Ten Commandments, are they? Not the first four, right? First of all, to do with your relationship with God. No, they're talking about the last six, which, of course, are the social commandments that every religion goes by, most societies go by. 
So what happens when we have no church? Does that mean that everybody runs away and, you know, grabs old ladies in the street for their handbags? No, that's not what's happening. My finding was that people have different sites of morality, different ways of practicing morality, and different kinds of morality, and as I will get to later, some of them outraged at what the church calls morality. So that was one finding. And the other one is about values transmission. Again, as I mentioned about social theory. What we know generally in social theory is that values are transmitted through various channels. Most, most importantly, the family, and that certainly happened here. But it was a transmission of no religion or less religion. And then through peer groups, yes, of course, very important too. And at the time of the baby boomers, there was a lot going on for the baby boomers. It was kind of a, a kind of perfect, perfect storm, really, where you had the baby boomers going through what they were going through, plus you had, for the first time, massive amount of higher education, people leaving home for the first time in the early 60s to go away with their peers. So having a lot of values transmission, then that, again, conforms to what we might expect to see. Another thing I have found, I've played with over the years, because I, I think it's quite interesting, is ancestral transmission. The idea that people have continuing bonds with their deceased relatives. That still happens, and I'm going to focus on that a bit later. It's really important to look at the idea of continuity. So I told you not to buy the book. Um, you don't have to, but I've highlighted these key words here because I want you to think about those as I go through the presentation. Is it, is it really the role of emotion that came through so often in my interviews, when people talked about why they left the church. And we found these, these sometimes these ideas that were bound up in angst, and sometimes in anger, and sometimes in boredom, sometimes in just no sense of it. They just decided because they couldn't be bothered not to, they couldn't be bothered to stay. So there's a lot to be said for looking at the process of people's disengagement, which I will get to in my depth of stories I'll do. I want to talk to you about these stories. I've selected three as examples of the many interviews I had. Three short stories. Let me start with the first one, the load of tosh. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that to a lot of these people, when they were like in their you know, teens, they suddenly found what they were hearing was, what they thought, quite ridiculous. They thought, well, where did this come from? We can't believe this. I then discovered something which is actually quite important. I think it's all important, but this I hadn't realized before. When children of that generation, in let's say the 50s, went to church, they didn't actually go to church. They went to Sunday school. And I know, particularly with the Methodist background, there's a different, you get from my accent, I wasn't born here, but there's a different idea of Sunday school in the UK than there is in North America, because there was a Sunday school movement, right, in the 1800s, for Sunday school, and it was very much like a school in the afternoon, and that's where children often went to you know, learn to read and get better at that. No, I'm talking about the typical Anglican church in the 1950s that decided to have a Sunday school, meaning you came into church with your parents, might hang around for half the first hymn, then you went away. You went away into a room where you did what? I asked the baby boomers, what did you actually do then? I don't know, coloring in stuff, maybe? Um, something like that. This was the first generation of Anglicans to do that, by the way. Okay? Before, that never happened. There could be an argument that, that, that segregating the children from the rest of the church may have had an impact. But anyway, they were the first ones to do that. So these children went away from the parents, went next door, hung out with their friends, did some coloring in, um, and that was really most of their ideas about what, what their church was going about. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden something happened. I deliberately put these words up here because they're possible to read quickly. That's how they felt. They said it was suddenly we were just given all these words to memorize, all these things to memorize because we were supposed to get confirmed. So we had to learn this like catechism. They had no idea what it was about. I thought, well, what were they doing with it? Well, they said, you know, we had lots of words, but what do we, what do we, how do we make sense of this stuff? And they were saying, you know, that it just seemed to us to be so improbable and implausible. And that was how I felt a lot of the time. That it was, as this, I won't read the, the quote, you can read it faster than I will, but as this, this young boy was saying, it was like confirmation. It's just what you did. You know, tick the box. You know, like going to the dentist. 
Yeah, so it was something you did. You didn't really engage in that much, and maybe not even believe in that much, but it was something you did. But it felt like a load of tosh. It just felt like meaningless things that didn't actually hit home to them. Didn't mean anything to them, didn't make them feel like they belonged to anything. And in time, a lot of them just thought, well, why would I even believe this stuff? Put this also in the backdrop now of the 1960s, where there was something else going on. There was more of a cultural expectation of less deference. There was a cultural expectation of more questioning. And a lot of people were telling me, reminding themselves of how it was in school, where teachers were often asking people to question. So there was a more of a questioning environment, certainly. And how did they feel? And they talked a lot about their emotion at that time. They couldn't remember the detail of the catechism, no. But they can remember how they felt about it. They can remember they felt bored, they felt alienated. They felt that, you know, this was not for them. They were going to have an exodus. I throw in religious language every now and then to confuse my people. So they were having an exodus. And how did they feel about that? Well, they said most of the time they were relieved about that. Because they didn't have to go to church anymore. Now, in my field, there are a lot of, um, especially theologians, who get, get very cross at this idea and say, well, the reason they stopped going to church is because their parents were too liberal. There may be a little bit in that. I talk a lot about, um, in my book, I talk a lot about the ambivalence of the, that generation, that maybe they were sorry, sorry to move away as well. But really what happened, I argue, was theologically correct. The children had taken on those vows for themselves. Yes. They were now adult members of the church. Yes, they were allowed to leave. And as this quote up here says, you know, and why not? You know, perfectly well-behaved young boy. And so they left in huge numbers. And this has been something that other members of other churches have, have also noticed. In fact, one uh, person I, I interviewed in, in, the, um, in Canada when I did some comparative research was talking about that. She said, they went through all of these things at church, then they were confirmed. We started calling that graduation from church, right? We never saw them again. So, that stuck. Okay, another, re another story I want to tell you is about climbing, I call it climbing the high moral ground. And it's a bit that not often is talked about, or not talked about enough with the idea of people leaving, is that there are certain mores of the church that many people, baby boomers, in the 60s started to find reprehensible and started to really feel was wrong wrong on a, on a really deep level, and for them, things that they just couldn't feel that they could live by. And this was a conflict for many of them. I one story, and I, I like the idea of the, this man who said he was an uh, uh, anti-Damacy moment, he talked about. Um, I was sort of laughing about that, because we thought, well, what was the road to Damascus? And let's go back over that story. You know, Saul was going along, he was going to arrest some Christians in Jerusalem, and then he had the blinding light, and then he got blinded, and then his friends helped him. So it's really a story about relationality as well, isn't it? His friends helped him. His friends helped him along. We have this even in the language we use today. Many people will talk about this. They had their Damascene moment, or they had their flash of light. Well, this fellow I interviewed said he had this as well, but it was very much in the opposite way. He was an academic, and he was at a conference in the States, and he said he was sitting there, and it was just around the time of an election, American election, and he was having a nice breakfast. He thought, oh, it was great open the newspaper, and there was a full-page ad about who to vote for, put in by the Catholic Church. And it told people that you shouldn't vote for this guy because he approved of birth control, which was, they said, just the same as genocide. <laughs> when I interviewed him, this baby boomer said, what? What are they thinking? He said, that's when I really realized that you know, Christianity, religion, had lost its moral compass. So many people, like him, felt shocked and disgusted when it came down to what they think were immoral ways of behaving and ways that they didn't want to belong to. Uh, somebody else I interviewed who talked about this, and I got this, this idea about this class-based hypocrisy when he was raised in a, a household where he had to pee outside and his, and his friend came over and was so surprised at that. He then began to get a sensitivity to what class was about. And he then began to see what he thought was real hypocrisy of all of these churchgoers who were so nice on a Sunday, but not the rest of the week. And class, social class, became, again, in the 1960s in general, quite a major thing for people. And that fed into it. A lot of people didn't feel that all those ideas they were hearing about 
have any real consequence in their lives. They didn't want the patriarchy. They didn't want the hierarchies. And they felt very strongly that they had a higher moral ground, a better moral ground. It's something that we don't, as scholars, talk about as much as we should, is what kind of morality replaced that they were learning in church. I also call this the end of theodicy. Um, theodicy is a term that's quite useful, but it's the way that we might think of through how people, in particularly monotheistic religions, have to work out the problem, sometimes called the problem of evil. Right? How can you have an all-powerful, good God, loving God, in the world, and bad stuff happens? All right, now, all religions work out, all monotheistic religions work out how to, how to, how to reconcile that. And you have various ways you do it yourself, I'm sure. Uh, the book of Job is one example. Maybe it's a test. Maybe it's beyond our control. Maybe God gave us free will, and so we went off and did this. But, but it takes some work to do this. What I found was that people were just saying, I'm over that. I don't care. What, if there's a God, can't he be a bit nicer? So there wasn't any appetite to engage in theodicy, to give God a chance. That ship had sailed for the baby boomers. So, let me just turn to my last point here, the belief in spirits. I have the audacity to put myself up against Tyler. He was the first professor of anthropology at Oxford. Well, he had to start somewhere. Um, now, he did a lot of good work. And one of the good things he did was he figured out, from looking at mainly other people's work and diaries, was that a lot of people who had the experience of seeing, they thought, their deceased ancestors in the room with them, we might call those dreams, but they thought they were real presences. They felt very strongly about that. They felt their ancestors were there, and they would be you know, communicating with them, and they began to venerate them. Tyler said that was the beginning of religion, ancestor worship. All right, you know, not, not a bad idea to start, but then he makes a mistake. Right? By defining religion as a belief in spirits, and here is where he went wrong, because you can have a belief in spirits without being religious. And unfortunately, it leaked into the certainly academic language where people talk about religious experience. Well, that can mean anything nowadays. But they don't see this as a secular experience as well, which it certainly is a secular experience in experiencing the presence of your deceased relatives. This is really common and not necessarily religious. And somebody said that certainly believe in the paranormal more than they believe in God. So there has been this, this conflation and this idea that we're going to shove these things together. If you're not religious then, you don't believe in anything, you know, numinous. You don't believe in anything transcendent. Well, well, who said that? We're just saying you're not religious. And so we need to keep the space open, keep the space open for transcendence. In many cases, keep the space open for people who have experienced this. And I found quite a few people who have experienced it. The anthropologists have this term, I think it's a good term, continuing bonds. But it's hard to find the vocabulary for what we're talking about here. If we're not going to call it a religious experience, what are we going to call it? And I had this uh, interview with this fellow, I call him, call him Simon. He told me very heartbreaking stories about when his young son was in the hospital and he thought he was really on death's door and was really worried. And then he said he felt very strongly as if his father was in the room. His father now deceased. His father was in the room with him. And he felt very strongly that his father's hand was on his shoulder saying, no, son, it'll be all right. It'll be fine. It'll be all right. And he said that was this presence, and he felt that was, to him, a really strong sign that his father was with him. And I somewhat glibly and rather stupidly said, oh, interesting. Um, have you had any other supernatural experiences? And he said, what? I didn't say it was supernatural. Oof. I thought, yeah. That was bad, as an interviewer, to put words in his mouth, but he didn't say it was supernatural. In fact, he said, I thought it was perfectly natural. So what do we call this? What do we call these continuing bonds? Somebody else was telling me the stories about her father and saying, we keep him alive. You know, we tell jokes about him. We remember stories about him. It's one way of keeping him alive. And maybe that is what people do. And why is it that, certainly in my field, amongst academics, we got so close-minded as saying that, well, if you're an atheist, you know, you don't believe in this stuff. Why? An atheist, right? Without theist, without God. It doesn't mean without grandma. It doesn't mean without the sense of grandparents still around, of parents still around. It doesn't mean that. 
So you could be without religion and still have the presence of your deceased relatives. So many people I interviewed when I was doing my PhD in 2003 to 2006, it was just like 14-year-old kids, the millennials, and they often told me stories like this about feeling that they had the presence of their deceased relative looking after them, even though they weren't religious. So you have to open up that space, and certainly the baby boomers had that space. They opened that up. So a couple of conclusions for you. First of all, that what I'm talking about here certainly conforms to social theory about social transmission. This is what we would expect, that values are transmitted through families, through peers. There's also this thing about church attendance that one of the early sociologists, Durkheim, would talk about, the need for a collective effervescence. And certainly those baby boomers didn't have that. Maybe that got you know, thrown into the mix somewhere. I think that's, a, that's part of the story. It's not all of the story. Also, let's not beat ourselves up about it. So what? Right? What's the problem with Christian decline? Are we saying it's really a bad thing? If churches close, why are we saying that's a bad thing? People today have morality. They have transmitted morality to their children. When we interview children of uh, millennials and, and Gen Zs, we find they're very nice people. They often call themselves this culture of sharing and collaboration. So did we actually do something wrong here? So there's a lot of, sort of angst in my field anyway about what do we do at the end of Christianity or the, when church is closed. And I'm not sure there's much to be done. I'm not sure that it's necessarily a crisis for anyone outside the churches. But I hope you may tell me otherwise. So I'm going to stop now talking at you, and perhaps you'll talk with me. Thank you. Professor, thank you very much indeed for a very uh, stimulating and uh, in enlightening talk. Um, I'm sure that we've got lots of questions around, and um, Doreen's got the other mic, so she's going to uh, go around. So, do you want a moment to think about them, or are you, are, are, no, no, there are no lots of hands up. So we've got a good, you know, a, a good, good more than more than half an hour to to explore these together. Thanks. The first question is usually the stupid one, why other people are uh, thinking of something sensible to say. But if uh, Eliot says, in the end is my beginning, can I start at the beginning and say that I had very much hoped to have done a little bit of research before I came to the lecture to get more out of it, and therefore was slightly horrified to find that with Amazon, which is usually a cheap uh, bookseller, uh, your book was 76 pounds. So I'm, you did start and nail that one straight away, but I hope that you won't be uh, shy to say what your discount might be. Thank you. And they usually are, are quite generous, and if I have enough people who come to me and say they'd like to then I'll get back in touch with them. But they'll probably discount it somewhere between 10 and 20%. But you know, it's a sad, it is a sad thing. These books are designed to go into university libraries. And the publishers always claim that they're doing this because they have so few books, really. I don't know. I think the profitability of publishers is, is kind of without my domain. But um, they would claim that their books would be used for courses. And so one book might be read by 20 people. But yes, they're not targeting the you know, normal market. So. Please do get in touch with me. I'm not sure that sociology is really the perhaps the right medium. Oh, I, I don't think the mic's on. Right. Okay. And I'm not sure that sociology is really the, the appropriate way to deal with this problem because I'll tell you a story. I've got two grandchildren who at that time were leaving, living in Sweden and I had driven 300 miles from Norway, and I was asked to put the daughters to bed. And I got them into their bunks and, uh, you know, bathed into their bunks, thinking, job done. I can now go and collapse for the drink. And a little voice in the bottom bed said, Nana, why are we here? What are we for? This is a four-year-old. And the voice in the top bed said, we're not for anything. We're just here. Now... 
where, um, I'm not sure you're asking the right questions. If you went round and you asked people, what do you think you're for? I think you might have got much more interesting answers. I mean, I was absolutely floored by this. <laughs> um, uh, I've, tried to, I've tested this out on some theologians, and they really had to think. But 20 years later, these two girls, still the one that is still asking what are we for, and the other one is quite sure that there is absolutely no purpose in life. So, what do you think? Well, I think it's interesting. Thank you for that. Yes, um, and I, I like your story. Um, and, and you know, out of the mouths of babes and children, right often come great wisdom. Um, I did discuss that with my baby boomer uh, interviewees. Sometimes we looked at the ideas of you know purpose of life, meaning in life. Um, and I think what I, I come away from from that piece of research and others is that meaning is very much a subjective term, and a lot of people find meaning in their relationships in their daily lives. They feel their purpose, if it is of anything, is to be, they might say, a good person and raise their children well if they have children. A lot of people find very much that relationality with human beings. Now, there is a whole group of people called humanists who would very much situate themselves there, who would be, as they say, uh, arguing for a fairer, juster society, and they think they, that it's better without religion, and find that they feel that they have this purpose in their daily lives, however they, they want to. I suppose, you know, ultimately, a lot of people might say that there's a difference between someone who's very religious, because if you're very religious, certainly the ones I've interviewed, would suggest that they had more of a purpose, in the sense that they said they had a God-given purpose. Now, of course, someone who's not religious wouldn't say that. But they didn't seem to me to be nihilistic, if that's the term. Didn't seem to me to be um, uh, broken by the idea they didn't have a higher purpose that it was sufficient to be, in their words, their ideas, a, a good person, living a good life? <laughs> um, how far is the, the concept of a generation central to, to your account? I mean, it's clearly a generational process in the sense that it's something to do with parents not handing on their religion to their children. But does it necessarily go in the sort of stepwise process that you were implying when you talked about you know, specific generations, baby boomers, millennials, Gen Z, and so on? I mean, to what extent could you make a lot of the same points and just see it as a lineal process going on perhaps also over a much longer period and the cultural changes that you talked about, more liberal societies rather than less authoritarian and other things like more social mobility and so on? But um, they're not specific, they don't sort of switch suddenly from one generation to the next. To what extent does your s research suggest that it's specific to those particular generations that you identified? Well, I mean, I think it's a great question, question because, of course, the idea of generation, as I mentioned, is a somewhat contested term anyway. Um, so what years are we talking about? And the, one that I pref the, the way that I prefer to think about it is, um, going back to the work of Carl Mannheim, who talked about a generation as a sensibility. And there are some generations who perhaps more than others would define themselves. And one of the questions I asked, I said, you know, would you say you're a baby boomer? Oh yeah, 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 we're part of that generation. Um, and some people define that in terms not just of their sensibility, but also as somebody said, you know, we're the, the pig and the python. It was a huge bulge. The baby boom was, was enormous, but that, you know, that's why they get the term of this, this people that came through it. But also Mannheim says, and I, I think it's worth thinking about, a generation would be the generation that sees itself as a generation, but also has certain things happening that help define itself. So for example, we might say that the baby boomer generation had certain things happening. Um, one of the things that was brought up a lot when I talked to people was this idea of university education. That for the first time in the early, and this was worldwide. It would happen more than, you know, differently in different countries, but it was a worldwide boom in higher education, which wasn't just that people got you know, educated, but they left home, typically. And that was a huge factor for too many people. Others said things like the, all the protests, the anti-Vietnam, there was a, a turn from deference that they felt strongly about it. Now, other of my colleagues who do more longitudinal and statistical research will say that there is sort of the, the long 60s they may talk about, uh, the earlier 60s. I picked up certainly something that I thought was interesting was the parental ambivalence of this 
generation that I had originally researched and thought was incredibly devout. But even then, I thought, you know, these women were quite funny, and they had a bit of, you know, spark about them. They weren't just boring women. And what I found in interviewing their children, the baby boomers, was this sense that sometimes the mothers actually transmitted this little bit of, of you know, ambivalence. Uh, biggest spike in divorces was 1947. Um, and some people say that's because, you know, men came back from the war and they're all shell-shocked and felt miserable, possibly. But other people point out it's because women went to work and after the war were told to get back and, you know, back into the homes and didn't like that very much. So there was stuff going on there that prompted that. So I think the reason that people look at this in terms of generations is that to, to see if we can identify a sense of self-identity, but also if there are sudden changes. And certainly the 60s in terms of a church attendance was, was fairly even, not, not so catastrophic as later. But things like confirmations just dropped out of nowhere. Um, so we might then say what's happening in that, in that time period. So it's a mix of both, I think. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Um, you were just talking about the period of immediately after the Second World War. Did anybody talk about the um, association of the church with the horrors of the Second World War or, and indeed the First World War as, as undermining and giving that sense that it was all bunkum? You know, the only time that came up I thought was interesting was when people talked about the Holocaust. That was much more about how could there be a God. Um, not so much about the roles of the church. But I mean, that's, that's something that is probably underlying some of the shock that people felt was what was going on and why did nobody do anything? Why did God not do things and why did nobody else do anything? Uh, yes, hi, thank you for that. Um, I would have to say, as a science teacher who was called by God age 40, I think there's always hope. Um, so I very much uh, think that I agree, obviously, we can't deny your observations, but I certainly think that God is still at work in the world, and uh, we have every reason to, to hope. So I don't necessarily agree with the conclusion that all is lost. Um, but uh, I just would like you to clarify... When you talk about church, are you talking about church universal here? Are you talking about everyone grouped together? Um, well, first of all, thanks for that. I mean, I did say at the beginning that as a social scientist, I don't have anything in my toolbox for you, but yes, pray, if that helps. Um, I, I typically try not to uh, undermine in my, in my own mind um, what might happen in the future. This is a trend that I see. When I talk about church, um, I'm studying there the Anglican church, in specifically, but linking it to the wider decline in Christianity, which we've observed uh, in the UK, in Northern Europe, and in North America. And there are, of course, denominational variations. Some churches are doing quite well, um, but the overall decline seems to be the same. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, just to note, I actually teach RE now as well, and I find it really interesting uh, when you talked about theological education. I do think that there's a, a definite lack there um, students particularly say, oh, miss, do you believe in the Big Bang or do you believe in God? Um, so uh, it's very interesting to talk about Aquinas then in that case and show that you can actually answer a lot of the questions that they have. And so theological education, I think, is really important. Yeah, it's something I'm trying to work on at the moment, actually. Um, in a forthcoming work on disability, I'm looking at um, what I'm trying to call, but I can't pronounce it properly, socio-theological approach. Because I think to understand the theologies behind what people are, are believing and uh, understand that and see how it plays out in the world is really important. Yeah, I quite agree. Thank you very much for uh, the talk and for, and for your books. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, so I, I just have a couple of points. The, the, the first is um, my understanding is that the, um, the, the attrition of church attendance uh, has been going on for several centuries. Um, a couple of years ago, we had Nicholas Orme's book suggesting that uh, the Middle Ages were not nearly as devout as many people had, uh, had often, have often believed. And um, 
then we have Clive Field uh, suggesting uh, as well that um, uh, attendance was, was actually quite poor in much of the early modern period. Uh, and uh, he wrote an article in the Archaeologia Cantica, which, Cantiana, which is the uh, county history uh, journal in 2008, um, noting that attendance in Kent uh, in the early modern period was particularly weak. Um, and we, we had, we had uh, um, church being made compulsory in this country with the Act of Uniformity in, in uh, 1552. And then it was repealed with the Act of Toleration in 1689. And, and that uh, allowed dissenters to attend their own conventicles. But the effect was to drive a coach and horses through the uh, coercive power of the church to compel people to attend. And his, his idea, which I'm, I'm sure, I guess you're very familiar with, is that, is that there has been a progressive attrition since, since then. And we see the extent of that in the famous 1851 census where um, it, the attendance was assessed and it was found that half the population wasn't attending church. Um, so it seems to me that this, this is part of a long sort of continuum. But the, the, uh, the other point I was going to make was about 1963 and Hugh MacLeod and others suggesting that that was a decisive moment, a sort of tipping point. And I've been uh, attending services, I've attended uh, services at almost 7,000 churches across every part of the country over the last 15 or so years, 15, 16 years. And it's become very evident to me that you have people who, people who had their formative experiences before 1963 are, are the bulk of congregations in almost, almost everywhere. Uh, and people who had their formative experiences after 1963 are, are much thinner on the ground. And what I'd suggest about 1963, further to some of the points that you, you were making earlier, was that um, it was the maudling boom in this country. You had uh, uh, savings that had accumulated. Um, you had uh, the relaxation of higher purchase. You had uh, bank rate cuts. You had um, uh, 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 other things which stimulated the boom. And, and, and this, this meant that people could purchase white goods. This allowed uh, lots of women to uh, enter the, the workforce en masse. Um, so do, do, you think that do you still think that 1963 is, is, a, is a significant uh, sort of inflection point? Oh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I do. I'm, I'm very familiar with Clive's work. In fact, he wrote a very good book review of my book, which he liked a lot, apart from, he said, there's not, there's not a much of the longer historical perspective. Um, no, I agree there have been times where, where there's been less church attendance. So I'm not focused specifically on church attendance, of course. I'm focusing on all the wider values that are coming up, not just with the census, but the British Social Attitude Survey and other surveys that point towards this growing sense of being not religious. And I think that's what I was trying to capture and, and transmitting those values of being not religious uh, to, their, to their children. Um, 1851 census, yes and no. Um, 1851 census didn't have a question about religion on it. What happened at the same time was what was called the census of worship which was a different group doing it, but the same day. Um, and I had to pick up that point because my research originally is pointed out that the first time a question about religion was put on the census was 2001, which was the first time it appeared on the census and wasn't the census of worship. So yes, I think we're talking about not, not different things, but I think my emphasis is on the, the values change and the change towards non-religion, not simply church attendance. Could I perhaps um, take advantage of having the microphone myself? Um, um, is the distinction, perhaps, that um, Grace Davy talked about interviewing people in hospitals um, in, I think, the 80s and 90s, and the women in the um, gynae ward who were middle-aged women, had all acquired some sort of patina of Christian language and the stories in Sunday school, um, whereas the women in the maternity ward, those stories didn't mean anything. And maybe tying that up with Richard Hoggart's um, similar claim 
and it's completely gone out of my head now, and it would, um, that what we're talking about is a generation um, who were brought up on hymns because of Sunday school and a generation for whom that is just not part of their background. So is, it would seem to me from what you're saying, is what we're talking about far more a change in the whole culture? It's not just a case of whether people go to church or not. It's whether any sort of traditional religious, in inverted commas, um, language and teaching is there within their mental framework. I think it's a very, very good observation. Um, as I was mentioning the work um, of my colleagues, Linda Woodhead, um, who did the, the research on Gen Z, they said it's just not on their radar. It's really just not on the radar. But also, I found amongst the baby boomers interesting because, you know, of course, the um, church attendance always spikes on Christmas Eve. That's a big deal, right? Um, which I always remind people uh, to be careful about thinking that means a return to religion because if you're really religious, you go on Easter Sunday because that's actually the point, right? Um, but no, people have said to people, well, why do you go to, to church on Christmas Eve? It's just nostalgia, it's family, it's remembering all those happy times around the fire. Um, and so I think there is a very strong sense of, of nostalgia and family. Also, you know, there's quite a lot of um, revival in early music, Thomas Tallis, Bird, um, most of which we might think is religious music, as it was at the time. But many people who, who like that sort of music will say they're not religious, but actually they like that kind of music. And a lot of the baby boomers that I, I interviewed, in fact, one of the most virulent atheists I interviewed sings in a choir in a church in a choir when they're doing talus because she loves that music. So there's a lot of overlap. And I, as you say, there's a lot of things going on in the wider culture. I'll get you next time. Should I just shout to you? No, no. I, th um, I think we've got one here. And then... All right. I'll get you next time. I'll make sure. This is a very short question. You, oh. ins you instance for us two church attendance statistics the local church with an attendance of 10, and some other church with an attendance of 2,500. Could you comment on an explanation? Of that uh, well, yes, um, there are a couple of uh, movements that are very powerful within the Anglican Church. Um, they call that the sort of evangelical wing of the Anglican Church, um, of which um, Welby is, is one. And some of those churches are very similar to what we might call um, charismatic or Pentecostal churches, um, and Holy Trinity of Brompton is, is probably one of the best known, um, based in London. And they average, yeah, 2,500 people on a Sunday. Very different from the average Anglican service, um, where certainly when I was doing my research with the older Anglican women, and we discussed that, they would refer to those people as the happy clappies, but not in a good way, some disdain. Um, and there, there's, no, there's quite a lot of interest in, in why those churches thrive. One of the reasons that's often put out is that the families are all very religious at home as well. You know, and this is one thing that I found was quite missing from the baby boomers, that um, very religious families will do things at home. They'll pray, they'll read the Bible. Um, when I interviewed people, they, they said they couldn't re remember doing anything like that. Somebody said, oh, I'd, okay, maybe we said grace once or twice, but that's when the grandparents came over. So, um, also, uh, places like um, Holy Trinity Brompton, you know, grow by, by it's so a magnitude, they're very, very strong in their publicity as well, and their ideals. So we do have, um, we do have spikes here and there, but doesn't offset the total decline. But that's the reason often people give, is the reinforcement of religion at home, and the charismatic, more Pentecostal, more emotional sense, which people quite like, some people quite like. And you asked a sort of rhetorical question at some point, that you said um, uh, being an atheist doesn't mean that you can't believe in spirits and you can't believe in ghosts. Who said that? Um, well, Richard Dawkins said that, and Christopher Hitchens said that, and most you athe that the um, contrast was made between scientific belief that required not having any religious belief, if that made sense. But what we seem to be finding now is even when we look at countries like Holland and things where there's a very, very low um, religious attendance, there is a very high number of people who believe there might be a heaven, that there might be some kind of life after death on earth and things like that. 
And I'm wondering, should we not be trying to cater for these things um, for people's well-being, I suppose? Because the other thing you said was, well, you know, church has gone, but does it matter? Look at the current generation, they're fine. But they're not fine when you actually, you know, I, mean, I, I work in mental health and things, and there's no space to suggest that the younger generation's mental health is much worse than the older generation. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that they need the rebirth of the Church of England or anything like that to help them, but I think we do need some medium in which we can communally express um, emotion and search for answers that science alone doesn't give. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I agree with you, the new atheists, um, I, but I think they're wrong. I, th I think Dawkins was wrong about that, um, and Hitchens, even though I liked his book. I think he's wrong to, to draw, draw, demarcate that so tightly. Um, but, but certainly, um, you know, the humanists have uh, funerals, humanist funerals, um, and I was asked by one of the members of their committee to address a group of um, the humanists because they were concerned when they conduct these funerals they said they didn't understand why at so many funerals people did talk about feeling the presence of their deceased relatives and what was that about, because they're supposed to be humanists. So I had to explain to them that it had nothing to do with religion. It has to do with perhaps being human, is that it's very strongly felt sometimes, the continuing presence of your deceased relatives. Um, it doesn't mean that you're religious. It means that you believe that presence is there, and that indeed that presence may be there. Um, so I, I think we have to, to open up that space. And I read something the other day, actually, um, when you're talking about mental health and, and spaces. When I did the, um, the work with the elderly women, one of the things I noticed was that churches stayed open sometimes to allow visitors to come in. And typically, those women would be posted at the door, or sometimes if they had a kitchen, they'd be in the kitchen, because somebody had to be there. And so I did quite a lot of my research with them on those days, and I found often the people that walked in were people that I wouldn't call them homeless, but they were precarious, the precariat. Um, they just wanted someone to talk to, someone to listen, have a cup of tea. And I said to the women sometimes, well, do they ever come to church? And I said, no, why would they? I said, okay, do you ever talk to them about coming to church? I said, no, if we did that, they wouldn't come back. And so I identified this you know, informal social network and the work they were doing, which of course the church never recognized that they were doing actually important work. The other day I read um, in a newspaper that Morrison's, the grocery store, and some regions have set up a little cafe chat desk or a table where the people are welcome to come, have a cup of tea, just hang out for a while, talk to each other. So I quite agree with the terrible slash in social services where you know, we don't have libraries anymore and pools are shut down. It's a very big deal. Where are those social spaces? A church is one place you could walk into. Uh, a library used to be. Yeah, it's a very. I think it's a very big problem. I agree. Yes, thank you. I think actually you might have just answered my question, which was for many people, surely in the 50s, 60s, etc., church was a place where you could belong. And now there are so many more things that you can belong to, and people have the transport to get to them, that it's not so much a question of what people believe as to do with where you feel you can belong. And so I wonder whether the beliefs are a bit of a sideline, really. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, and I certainly agree that, particularly I, I had some interviews where people said it was a social thing, it was our social life. And in especially smaller communities, the church was the center for them of social life. That's where they had their suppers and picnics and dances. So that was very important back in the day. Um, and so I think that exactly that has been overtaken by other things. When I talk about this with... Um, with my students, I try to get them to think about religion, just as you say. Think about beliefs, but also think about belonging and think about behaviors, because it's all aspects of being religious and, and not religious. So the sense of where I found that there was some diversion, I suppose, was the sense that because some of those beliefs became alien to people, they didn't feel like they belonged there either. So I think there's some, sometimes a bit of an overlap.
you've given us some idea of the effectiveness of Anglican Sunday school work. Have you any research on the effectiveness of free church Sunday school work, Methodists and others? I'm thinking of particularly uh, the experiential approach, the work of uh, Ronald Goldman of the Selyoke College building on the theories of Jean Piaget. That was, I think we called it the experiential approach. Have you any research, any sort of uh, research material on that, the effectiveness of it? I don't. Um, I don't at all. Um, I wasn't doing a comparative study when I did my Anglican book, and honestly, I didn't find much in my sort of cursory glance that's been published on Sunday schools, particularly in that period, and any difference between their approaches. But it would be an interesting research project. You made very clear the geographical areas you're talking about, but I was wondering if, if your work and your reading gives you any reflections on other parts of the world. Uh, I mean, I'm particularly, uh, I've been involved with African churches. Um, any reflections on this? Yes, well, you're quite right. I have to locate the work somewhere, so I was locating it in, in the global north. Um, things are very different in the global south. Um, and I think there's a lot of research that's very interesting about the, the role of churches in Africa, in different countries, and the role overlap there is also with um, welfare provision and social services, which doesn't really occur here. And I think that's a very interesting project because it, it does involve so much about the community and about other work that needs to be done. Um, so I, I'm, I recognize that, and also there's parts of the world where I think there's been some backlash because of that. Um, because some of the scope perhaps became too big for people. But no, it's um, very much uh, a different story. The only time I kind of touch on the Global South is when I'm talking about the Anglican Communion and some of the, I don't know, schisms they have uh, between the valleys of the Global North and South. And there's a real um, interesting power you know, imbalance there about who has the right to speak to the Anglican Communion. You know, they have the Lambeth Conference every now and then, and it's always the thing, who's going to turn up? Yeah, no, it is quite, it's quite a different story. It seems to me that young people are permanently plugged into their iPhones, like an umber like us, in fact. And we know what young people like doing and where they like get to going to do these things, music, their peer group, etc. It's food, drink. We know all of that. But the church simply isn't prioritizing enough spend, enough action to galvanize uh, Christian education. You can call it that very broadly. And the church has got to change its ways if it wants to keep these people on board or just educate everybody across society about what church is and what church can be and what it can be for you. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to comment on. Well, I'm not an evangelical. Um, I don't have any sort of a, uh, experience in that. Um, I would say that you said that you know they're plugged into this, which is true. Um, it's not that they've left or they're leaving. They've never been. And those are the people I'm talking about, people who've never been to church. Um, sometimes in churches people think, I know from what I've studied, you know, if only our music was better. I think, if only your music was better, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get a 12-year-old kid who's never been involved in a church or religion come in on the, off the street to hear your music. It's much more of a, of a cultural and social function. So what else is going on in your life? And we do have religious education in, in school, which is, you know, is, is mandatory. Um, and I'm quite impressed with it. I mean, it's very broad and, and sometimes conducted very well in terms of education. Um, I'm not sure that that will make up for the, now we've got probably two generations of a loss of, in my particular examples, a loss of church and Christian beliefs and behaviors. I very much enjoyed everything you said, and I felt I could identify with a lot of it, as I have 10 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. 
But the question I have is whether, because what you were talking about was the Anglo-Saxon cultures, this is very different from the rest of the world, which I often inhabited. And if so, why? Now, my world tends to be an imperial one. And there, I would argue that the most lasting legacy of empire has been church affiliation. And I can think of societies in, elsewhere in the world, and this is where you've already done some answering, where Catholicism can be rampant, where Pentecostalism is certainly rampant. And so maybe we Anglo-Saxons are unique um, in the way in which you describe the changes of attitude to religion and worship? Well, perhaps it's probably outside my domain because I haven't done the search in, in, um, in other countries, but anecdotally, I know I had an experience once which I thought was really interesting. I was um, on holiday and I was in Sri Lanka, and because I do this sort of work, I, I wandered into a church, and I was with my son who was working in Sri Lanka, and we wandered into a church and sort of looking around, and the priest came over and said hello, and I said hi. Oh, where are you from? From England, and you know I studied Christianity. Oh, well, would you please come, you know, to my house and have some tea? So we went and had a cup of tea, and we were talking. And um, it was this really multicultural approach that I thought was really interesting because he said about his church, and he said, "Well, we have a, a nursery where we teach the um, you know young preschool children to read and write and get some you know into going to school and, and getting a head start." I thought that was great. And he said, "Oh yeah, so you know we have so many kids, you know, so many of the." Um, the Tamil tea piece pickers, children come here, and the Buddhists, you know, so we get really lively. I said, oh, so the Tamils and the Buddhists come here? Oh, yeah, to the preschool. And I said, oh, and then do they come to church? And he said, well, no, they're Tamils and Buddhists. <laughs> Why would they? And there was a sense of us community that the church was open to, and a sense that this had a far greater role in his mind than just their particular denomination. So, you know, we were talking about earlier about, about the other societies. I think there's... I think the churches are very much more integrated in wider forms of life in different countries than the Church of England tends to be. I always found the Church of England during my, my um, research incredibly self-focused. I know in, in, in one area where I was doing research, there was like three Church of England churches, and they all have congregations of around 30. And so I said at one time, I said, why don't you just kind of band together into one church? And, oh, we can't do that. You know, very parochial. No, no, we are who we are. So, I don't know, there just some, sometimes seems, tends to be that sense of uh, focus, if, to put it politely. Um, so, I think my question is, what did you, you briefly touched on patriarchy being an issue. Um, what do you mean by that? Because I think often it's talked about in a way where it's like assumed that because church leaders are often men, that is the issue. But I think anecdotally, from my friendships, I think it's more the fact that God is like perceived as this man, and we need to like decenter that situation. That and like now, younger people are saying, "Oh, God is a woman. God is a woman." But I think further from that, if we need to like remove God from anything human at all, it's not a person. It's an it's a experience. So I guess, what did you mean by patriarchy? Well, what they meant um, when they used the term, because I picked it up ready for my interviews, what they meant was the, uh, both things you said, I mean, the male god, but also the male priest, typically, uh, and other people at the front who were men. Um, and some talked about that in, in wider ways. One, one, one gentleman said to me, he went to a funeral with his wife, and it was his wife's aunt who had died, and they were very close. And his wife wanted to make a few remarks, and the minister just shut her down you know, because it wasn't appropriate. So there is a sense, and I think, but again, looking at the time, right, this was in the 60s for a lot of people, where that was really taking off sensitivities towards patriarchy. We were really taking off. And so I think that picked up both angles, that God was perceived as man, man ran the churches, there were these hierarchies, and that conformed also to a, a wider trend towards less hierarchy and, and less patriarchy, or desires towards less. I think I'm running out of steam here, so can we just take maybe one last question? 
Yeah, you've been very resilient. Thank you so much. One last question. I was a, a previous speaker on a, on a Russian topic, and in my uh, study of that um, country, I came across a priest who was very influential in, in an atheistic context, in sort of appealing to intellectuals. And uh, his approach was to say, okay, um, you, don't, you don't use the term God, and, and uh, uh, God, you're skeptical about God, but we're going to talk about goodness. And this went down well. And um, uh, it seemed an imaginative uh, way of finding a, a sort of co common ground. So I guess one question is, did you at times have a sense that the churches you were looking at lacked imagination in uh, engaging with the kind of questions people were asking? Um, yes and no. I mean, some churches were, were, were quite hopeful that they could engage um, with people that made, made a very strong attempt to bring in people from different walks of life. Um, others were more smug, I suppose, and thinking, well, this is the way we've gone. And certainly, the women that I interviewed were of the sort that believe very strongly in keeping things as they were and not changing things. And I know that there had been, at times, some, um, you know, debates, for lack of a more strong word, between them and the priests, that they felt that they didn't want to have innovation. And sometimes they were looked down on for that. They wanted to preserve their tradition. So it depended on the, on the church, but there's always, I think, that tendency to, you know, preserve what we've got as a good thing, because that's what we've done before, and a little fear of changing it. But I think those days were possibly going, because over time, of course, those you know, older people have gone away and they're not being replaced. So it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Hello? Yes? Can you hear me? Well, thank you very much, Happy, indeed, and for fielding so many questions as well. Um, I'm really pleased to give this vote of thanks. Um, from my point of view, I was brought up in a secular family, um, and my parents decided that we would be allowed to choose for ourselves. My sister very quickly became an avid atheist and is to this day, and I caught the bug um, of Christianity through uh, Church of England schools and through the hymns that we sung and then through studying Robert Browning at A-level. We're all very big mysterious. Anyway, I have clung on to the faith, um, uh, not without problems, but uh, I do find that contemporary theology actually is a great group to belong to because it allows you to ask the questions and I was never one to be told I had to believe X, Y, Z. But, um, so I do appreciate CTG, and I really appreciate this evening's meeting. I was, I was also very interested in you, the phrase you used about teenage angst, because I do recognize that that was what I was going through when I was searching. But I have chats with my sister to this day, and really our outlook on life the difference between it is paper thin. And I often say to her, it's just a cigarette paper between what I believe and what you believe. But there we are. That's the, that, that's the, the really important bit that's missing. Also, the speaker who asked the question about her grandchildren, I know from my grandchildren that um, they ask the most theological questions at the youngest of age. But we just sit there totally tongue-tied, unable to know how to answer them. And I know that um, although I may bu maybe bucked the trend in the 60s and became uh, converted, I haven't managed to pass it on to my children that well, and certainly to my grandchildren not at all. So there we are, another failure. But thank you so very much. I do still think that that overwhelming question, what are we here for, is where we should be starting. But thank you so very much indeed. Just a few announcements. Um, first of all, 
a reminder that the date for next month's talk has changed. So we'll be meeting on Wednesday, the 24th of April, at the usual time of 7.30, when Dan and Lavinia cohn sherbock will give us a double act, so um, two for the price of one. They'll be talking about the Messiah in Christianity and Judaism. The reason for the change is to avoid a clash with the Dean, who will be speaking in the church hall just over there on Wednesday the 17th of April, and he will be speaking on what is a cathedral for. So if you're interested in that, go to the Canterbury Society meeting on the 17th of April at 6.30 for seven. Um, I also have to tell you that we've had to make a change to the May lecture. Um, Charlotte Slay, who is our advertised speaker, has been landed with a work commitment that she can't get out of. Um, Charlotte is extremely apologetic and embarrassed, um, but we hope to reschedule her for next year. Um, but I'm delighted to announce that in her place, Jennifer Walters, who is both a scientist and a priest, will be talking about the relationship between faith and science. Um, I haven't got an exact title yet from Jennifer, but one will be circulated with the next mailing. If you are not on our email list and would like to be, um, then please do sign the list that you'll find on the table um, in the vestibule. Um, I can promise you that all you will get from us will be one reminder a month between January and June about the next meeting plus the full program, which we normally send out in December. So we look forward to seeing you at 7.30 on the 24th of April and possibly see some of you at the Dean's talk the week before. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Alan.